Hey everyone, today on The Final Bar, it's Thursday, November 17th. We're talking to Julius DeKempener from RRG Research. We will talk asset rotation, particularly the US dollar as the S&P, the major averages, chop around net negative. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny and cold Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we reflect on these markets using the language of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is designed to help you understand the message the markets provide back to us in the form of price and volume, sentiment data, breadth data, all those uh, pieces of information that overall paint a pretty good picture, a pretty uh, characteristically positive picture or constructive picture of the market environment. We're going to talk today about the S&P, the major averages kind of pulling back a little bit. And it's really sort of a stalled out week, right? You have this rally mid-October into mid-November. Now we're sort of uh, waiting. It's sort of wait and see mode. Is there enough momentum, enough buying power to push the S&P above its 200-day moving average? That's the open question. We'll see what we can answer here uh, today. Just to let you know what's coming up on uh, Stock Charts TV, and particularly this show, The Final Bar, we have Julius DeKempener joining us here shortly from Amsterdam. Next week, shorter week because of the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So we have Ari Wald from Oppenheimer joining us on Tuesday, the 22nd. We will be off Wednesday through Friday celebrating Thanksgiving with our family. and wish you guys the best as well. And we'll be back the Monday afterwards. Also, we just recorded our latest episode of The Pitch earlier today. Julius DeKempener was part of that. John Kosar from Asbury Research. Jeff Huge from JWH Investments, all giving you five pitches each. Then we discuss them as a group. It was a lot of fun, good conversation, good ideas. Check that out at stockcharts.com slash the pitch, and it'll air tomorrow morning on Stock Charts TV at 9 o'clock Eastern. Let's continue on our show today with the market recap. Let's talk about sort of this sort of pullback uh, day, brief pullback, minor pullback, not a huge deal, but overall stalling out so far, not really following through to the upside. And I'll show you what I mean on some of the individual charts. Choppy session overall, we opened lower around 39.10 for the S&P 500, pushed higher over the course of the day, generally speaking, but really not getting a lot of, uh, of gains and certainly not making it above yesterday's close, down about a third of a percent for the S&P and the NASDAQ, the S&P closed just below 39.50. Mid caps and small caps all down as well. The VIX lower as well. So this is yet another day. It's so interesting because most of the time you think of the S&P and the VIX as inverse, uh, as having an inverse relationship. And in a lot of ways, sort of, sort of a perfect negative correlation, meaning anytime the S&P goes up, the VIX goes down and vice versa. What's happened this week is most of the days this week, certainly the last couple of days, We've seen the S&P and the VIX actually move together. So the S&P and the VIX uh, both down today. Uh, and uh, that, that shows you that that relationship in a little way, a little bit, it's fluid. And then the reality is it's not, you know, the VIX is not the inverse of the S&P. It's looking at the options market, looking at positioning data. It just tends to have that inverse relationship. The reason why I think that's so important, we're going to talk a little later in our segment on market sentiment. Uh, we will talk about the VIX uh, volatility analysis and why the VIX level of 20 has been a really key one in 2022, maybe something to watch through the course of uh, of the rest of this year. Interest rates overall moving higher today with the 10-year yield around three, uh, we'll call it 378 uh, going into the end of the day, the uh, long bond yield around 390. Bond prices coming off today as the dollar index actually pushed a little bit higher, about 0.4% using the UUP, which is that bull bullish dollar ETF we tend to track. Gold and silver prices both down a bit today. Gold down uh, about three quarters of a percent. Silver down over 2% along with crude oil prices uh, as well. Energy actually one of the better uh, sector days. Actually finished up at the top of the list here uh, going into the close, but not a great follow through to the upside for commodities uh, either. Very much a mixed bag in crypto uh, land where you have Bitcoin prices up about a quarter of a percent. Ether down 1%. Ethereum is testing that 1200 level. We came down to that yesterday and today sort of have revolved around that 
uh, point. It's sort of a classic pattern, right? You, you you come down to a support level, then just sort of chop around there. And, and, and what this tells you is that Ethereum has settled into an equilibrium, right? Right about 1200 is where is where uh, investors, where traders see this price. Whenever you have sort of a narrowing of volatility, which is what I would describe this as, John Bollinger would tell you narrowing volatility usually precedes the big breakout, right? See which way we break out of this range to the upside or the downside. And that usually tells you a lot about the direction of momentum uh, going forward. Bitcoin struggling to get back above 17,000. This is coming down from the low 20s before the whole FTX, uh, Binance, uh, et cetera, debacle. We'll see if enough stability uh, sort of builds for Bitcoin to recover, but not seeing enough of that just yet. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we had the pitch earlier today, which will air uh, tomorrow morning. We're editing up that content, but it was a really fun conversation. We talked a lot about just you know the general approach to stock picking in this environment and how to think about this sort of rally phase. And I would say on the discussion, we had a range of general um, perspectives, some a little more constructive than others, but at the end of the day, all recognizing this rally phase going into resistance and and I think that's the um that's the the key here into the uh, holiday week next week and and probably beyond into uh into December as we wrap out 2022. The bear market rally is again I would still feel very comfortable labeling this as such uh impressive out of the October lows very similar rally to what we saw in uh in June and even more than the bear market rally that we saw in March. What changes this from a bear market rally versus something else? is that you don't just trade up to resistance, you trade through resistance, right? Enough buying momentum, enough buying power is there that uh, that, that we don't just test the resistance level, we actually blow through it to the upside. So at this point, for now, we've stalled out around 4,000. That's a Fibonacci level. Earlier this week, we went through a lot of detail as to uh, why that is important. So if you missed it, go back to Tuesday or Wednesday show, we went through uh, those measurements and why 4,000 is so important. That's the lower end of the shaded area. We also have the 200-day moving average. We have a trend line using the 2022 highs. All of those are kind of just above current levels from around 4,000 up to 4,100. So that's sort of a key range to get through. If we would get through there, bad news is we have the August highs not too far above there, right? Another 200 points higher, and we get right up to that August high. The question I would be asking if I'm an investor, which I am, is how likely do I see it that the S&P finishes the year above 4,300? Um, that's an important question to think about because then that would probably tell you uh, what uh, leadership groups probably tend to do uh, better or worse, right? What does that tend to mean? What would that probably mean in terms of the dollar, uh, in terms of uh, interest rates? What, what are interest rates doing in that environment if the uh, if the S&P, if risk assets are rallying significantly from here? Thinking about some of those different uh, potential outcomes uh, can be really, really valuable. There's also a risk that we go and retest the lows. It's you know, maybe unlikely that we get down to 3,500 in the next couple of weeks, but it's theoretically possible. So thinking about some of those different alternative scenarios and what they might mean uh, can be really valuable. As we're hitting resistance, one thing I'm looking at too is the momentum, right? The RSI, which is stalled out so far right at 60. And that is a very classic pattern in a bear market phase. You rally up to an RSI of 60 and you don't get much above there. So that might be an interesting uh, level to uh, to watch. That's a whole approach of RSI range that Connie Brown popularized in uh, in her book, building on uh, some of the work of um, Andy Cardwell and others who really uh, popularized the use of the RSI indicator. Finishing off here, our market recap, just looking at sectors very briefly, we have the energy sector, technology, both positive, but just narrowly, not by much. Consumer staples essentially flat. After that, everything else is down. And some of these down quite a bit. Utilities uh, down 1.7%. Uh, consumer discretionary, 1.2%. Real estate materials, uh, just under 1%. So while the uh, major averages settled in, le you know, less than half a percent down from yesterday, you had some individual sectors really sort of uh, drawing down on some of those previous gains. And interesting to see energy and technology, one and two. Energy, the top performing sector in 2022. Technology, one of the, one of the ones that struggled mightily in 2022. Both of those having a, uh, I guess, a decent day holding uh, previous gains and not uh, selling off with the rest of the market today. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Julius DeKempener. We'll see you in a minute.
Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Julius DeCampeter. First off, we welcome your questions. We do a mailbag twice a week, and we'll do one tomorrow on Friday's show. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. Larry Williams just posted his latest market outlook. We have our latest episodes of The Pitch. We have all of our fantastic uh, programming every trading day. A lot of great weekly shows making sense of these markets in uncertain times. All of that is available for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Julius DeCampener. Julius is the founder of RRG Research, uh, has been part of the Stock Charts uh, family as a contributor, and now working more with our data team to upgrade our use of data. And Julius, it is awesome to see you. Welcome back. Thank you, Dave. Long time no see. We had fun earlier today recording the pitch. That was a good one. Everyone will see that uh, tomorrow morning, but it's good to have you back. And thanks for uh, doing a couple of things today for us. We're looking at the RRG and we're talking about currencies. I often bring this up on the show with the 11 S&P sectors, but I, I appreciate you sharing that. You can obviously use it on a lot of different asset classes. Dollar strength has been a big story in 2022. What does this tell you now? Yeah, so one of the reasons I want to talk about currencies uh, and show it on RRG, first of all, because as you say, the 11 S&P sectors, that's the probably the most demanded, most used um, version or implementation of RRG. But we can actually use it on all asset classes and currencies is, is one of them. And it's, I believe it's, it's often um, underlooked, overlooked. Yeah? So mm -hmm. people are not paying enough attention to currencies. I remember when I was working on a trading floor, like a real old trading floor where people were shouting and screaming <laughs> that when something was happening in the markets, the first corner where you saw it was the currencies. The currencies mm -hmm. were the first one to start trading. If people started to shout in the currency corner, you could see it flow over to, to fixed income, to futures, and then into the equity markets. So currencies are important. The big story of, of the US dollar over the last year, year and a half, is, is it's all about dollar strength. Um, dollar strength has driven the market up. And we came to a period of um, dollar weakness right now. And if you look at this RRG, and I specifically asked you to use the CTR button on the right, which basically centers the RRG, and doesn't fill it up because it gives you a very good site where all the currencies, so these are the, the G10 currencies with the US dollar as the benchmark in the middle, are all to the left, which means that they're all in a relative downtrend versus the US dollar. So this is, this is telling you that the dollar is the strongest currency. And you see that they're going up. So that means dollar weakness. These currencies are all strengthening versus the US dollar. Now, if you switch that to a monthly, you will actually see what the long-term picture looks like. There you go. They're all pushing deep into that lagging <laughs> quadrant. So these long-term trends, this long-term strength for the US dollar is still there. And what I want to bring up, because in my show, Sector Spotlight, every Tuesday, I, I often talk about uh, euro dollar and, and put US dollar in relationship to other asset classes. So if you bring up the, uh, the daily chart of euro dollar, then you can see that we're actually, we broke out of that falling channel and we're working our way higher. You can see that there is a little bit of overhead resistance um, where we could end up. But the, you know, the general picture based on this chart looks pretty strong um, for the euro, so weak for the US dollar. If you then move to the weekly chart, you will probably you get a little bit more perspective. And you can see that around that 106 area where that low early 2020 was, was an important uh, low to the left. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. So, um, so we're running into that resistance area. If you look at the RSC, RSI shows nice positive divergence. So that all adds up to a positive story for the euro. And you could be inclined to say that, hey, this is the end of that downtrend that we've seen, that end of that massive move from 124 all the way down to 95 cents. But then you look at the monthly chart. And if you bring up the monthly chart, there you go. We just broke out to the downside. This, to me, is a major breakout below that 104, 105 area, where you can see uh, multiple lows over time, even going back to 2003, 
Um, you could draw, if you if you draw the, a little bit further back to the left, it becomes a little bit fuzzy. But I, I hope you agree that that 105 area is super important for uh, for euro dollar. <clears throat> and we're actually pulling back right now. So we, we broke down a couple of months ago. We're now pulling back. So on this chart, the move that we've just seen, which looks massive on the daily chart, in this perspective is, is only a small pullback. So I am very curious to see what the market's going to do around that 105 area. If we're going to put in a new low, a new lower high there, I think there is much more in store uh, for dollar strength, euro weakness. Mm. And it's interesting as you, as you uh, thanks so much for hitting on all this. The multiple time frame analysis is so valuable. And a lot of times we sort of get our blinders on and focus on one time frame, forget about the overall trend. You know, as you've seen, you know, the euro weakening through the uh, through the course of 2022, obviously the dollar strengthening, you know, some have called the dollar sort of the, the wrecking ball for risk assets, right? The dollar's been so strong that everything else has been struggling. I know in particular for U.S.-based investors, it's been tough to justify going outside the U.S., places like India with pretty decent stock markets, but just the currency impact has, has hurt it. How does this analysis of the dollar, what does that mean for investors looking internationally? Is this the time or not? Well, I think it 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 makes it more interesting for U.S. investors to invest abroad, and you can mm. see that actually. There's also an RRG that that pulls up uh, a set of international indexes, and there you can see the impact of um, how how the S and P rotates uh, versus um, the Dow Jones World we have there as a, as the benchmark. So you can see actually the international impact on uh, on those markets. Uh, and as you say, uh, I think you know if you if you bring that up, the uh, world, yeah, there you go. This one, yeah. <laughs> Be careful. This very very on purpose. These are indexes and not yeah. ETFs, because if yeah. you bring up the ETFs, you will bring in the currency effect that we just wanted to take out. So that's one thing that I really want to warn everybody about. You want to do the international markets? Look at the underlying indexes because that's what you'll be trading. The U.S. dollar effect into the currency of the of the various countries will be to either be a, a drag or a positive. Well, right now it's becoming a positive. It's ha it has been a drag, which kept everybody inside the U.S. And now they may start to look outside the U.S. And if you look at Mexico, is 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 right there into uh, into yeah exactly. The other ones, uh, Bovespa, India, uh, mm. Indonesia, they're all rolling over now. But you can see how strong they are. And if you look at the S&P 500, that's inside weakening, very close to the benchmark, but pointing towards lagging. So you can see the preference for international markets over the S&P 500 right now. This is fantastic, Julius, and a great reminder to think about uh, rotation in a lot of different areas, not just in sectors, but with currencies, with global markets. Thanks so much, Julius. Great to see you. Go get some sleep, and we'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thanks, man. That's Julius DeCampener. Julius is the founder of RRG Research, a longtime Stock Charts contributor. And uh, it's really, uh, it's been one of the great pleasures joining Stock Charts, getting to work with guys like Julius uh, a little more often. Just so you guys know, as we're whipping around some of these RRGs, there are a couple things you can do to make this a much more dynamic analysis of different market environments. Number one, remember, uh, there's this little groups button. We have a lot of pre-canned things that Julie sort of pre-set up for you. So you can look at key members of individual um, uh, sector ETFs. You can look at different styles, different cap tiers, different global indexes, and also compare them to one another. Also non-equity indexes as well. And also the time frame. I tend to use the weekly as my main time frame, but I often am using the weekly and the daily when I'm looking at the 11 S&P sectors. It tells you a lot about short-term versus long-term strength and weakness. Great take there, as always, from uh, Julius de Campener. Let's continue on our show today with our next segment, Getting Sentimental. We like to do on Thursdays, check in on some of the sentiment data. A lot of it updates on Wednesday and Thursday. So it's a really good opportunity to just see where things are at. When we analyze price, we are analyzing how uh, investors are voting with their feet or voting with their capital, right? What are they buying and selling? And that is obviously reflected in prices, right? As prices go up or down. Uh, survey data, other positioning data can give you sort of a look underneath the hood, right? What are people actually saying about their perspective on the market? Are they optimistic or pessimistic? Are they bullish or bearish? How are they positioned in different areas like options? And by looking at all that relative to the underlying indexes, we can maybe put together that uh, or maybe make a more complete picture of investor sentiment. We'll start with volatility. I was in, interviewed earlier this week for 
uh, Fox Business, and we were talking a little bit about uh, volatility and, and particularly about the VIX. And one of the things that I pointed out was as you rally in this phase, like we are uh, October into November, we had similar uh, rallies in July and August, another one in February and March. In each of those previous times, the VIX got down to around 20. From there, uh, the VIX uh, volatility started to increase. That had been a period of uh, lessening volatility as the market sort of set, sort of settled into a nice rally. So you can see the uptrend in March, the decline in the VIX, the uptrend in July, the decline in volatility, the same thing now October, November with the VIX coming off. So those last couple times, what has happened is that the VIX has hit, hit 20. That has been the exhaustion point of this uh, of this rally phase and we've rolled over. Now, is that a hard and fast rule? Is VIX 20 all you need to know? Absolutely not. And I think this is just one piece of many. And I'll tell you why, right? Back in the second quarter of 2021, 20 had been a floor until it wasn't anymore. We actually settled into a nice, slow and steady incline. This is when the uh, FANG stocks were dominating things uh, and the volatility was actually relatively low. It sort of settled in between 15 and 20 or 25. So in the current volatility regime, which is what I would call a particular range that we've been in, we've been in this one for quite some time, really since November of last year. It's been pretty clear cut, ranging between 20 and 30 to 35 on the upper end. Waiting to see what happens if we do get a VIX of 20, I think could be important. Now, that's what we talked about back in August. And when we sold off and the volatility increased, it all of a sudden looked a lot like the top in uh, in March and April. That is exactly what I'd be looking for here if you continue to see volatility decline, because a rally in stocks has been met, as usual, with a general decline in volatility. Next chart is looking at the AAII survey. This is a weekly survey of individual investors. And the question is something like, are you bullish, bearish, or neutral on stocks for the next six months if I remember right, a lot of people can, you know, you can participate, join the organization, participate in the weekly survey. One of the great benefits of this is that it's been running for decades. So you can get a pretty good history going back through some bull and bear cycles and see what the volatility, uh, excuse me, what the uh, the survey data has been. You know, what what levels of bullishness and or bearishness do we have now relative to some of those previous cycles? You can see since the September, uh, mid-September period, you've seen a general incline in bullishness this week. We had uh, one of the highest readings we've seen. And uh, look, don't look now. We're actually right at the level of bullishness that we had at the August peak. So in August, we rallied up uh, to the 200-day moving average. We got to around 33 34% bulls. And that was pretty much the end of the move. We're kind of right there. Last week, a little bit lower. And we spiked up this week. You know, people getting a little more optimistic given the, the rally that we've seen in stock. So it is not lost at me that we are at the upper end of where we've been in 2022. And previous peaks in late March, uh, in late May, in mid-August, have all had a level of bullishness right around the level we are seeing right now. Bears actually declined. We were up around uh, 45 plus percent last week. We're back down to around 40 percent, which means the spread between the two is a pretty uh, pretty low, to be honest with you, uh, six or seven percent, meaning uh, bulls minus bears. So it's a negative six or seven percent at the moment. If you look, most of 2022 has seen bears outnumbering bulls, in some cases by as much as 40%. And as we went into the low in October, similar to when we went into the low in June, you saw bears outnumbering bulls by about 40%. It was sort of the end of the move and we came back up here. We've not been net positive, save for one week in 2022. That was in late March, where we just narrowly got uh, bulls outnumbering uh, bears. So the reason why this is important, because we are having this uh, increase in optimism, this decrease in pe pessimism, which looks to me very similar to what we've seen at the end of previous bear market rallies. Now, again, that is assuming that that pattern continues. If we see a sustained rally from here, you could see this relationship change. And all of a sudden, it starts to look like the fourth quarter of 2020, where you settle into a particular range. And then all of a sudden, there's an increase in bullishness as a more sustained uptrend happens. So once again, it's all about whether the S&P can power through the levels that it's near right at the moment. Just to finish off here briefly on the name exposure index, no real change in the last four weeks have been about the same. It's around 50, 55% uh, allocation to equities. That is below the average that we've seen in 2022, um, sort of above the average we've probably seen for, uh, excuse me, uh, a, a below average for the long-term history. On average, if you go back years and years, it's about 70% general allocation for 2022, it's been well below that. It's averaged more around 40 or 50%. So we're kind of middle of the road for where we've been in 2022. But again, all of that pretty low relative to historical positioning. The Rydex flow is coming off a little bit, and this is plotted inversely just to match uh, the, uh, the the trend we generally see in sentiment 
uh, data. So if these bars are very low, that means the value is very low. Uh, excuse me. So the bars are very high. The value is very low. That means investors are positioned more on the offensive side of the Ridex family. If these bars are very far from the zero level, um, that means the uh, value is increasing. That means people are more bearishly positioned. So we're coming out of some of the more bearish position we've seen in years uh, back here in late September, early October, as investors have uh, taken some of the defense off the table uh, in the Ridex family. I just want to finish off with this chart very briefly uh, in our discussion on the pitch. And again, I'd encourage you to watch that tomorrow morning. We'll post it on our uh, on our on-demand platform soon after. Uh, but one of the things that Jeff Huge uh, brought up was the spike in the equity-only put-call ratio. Now, when I show this chart, which we usually do it on Thursday, I usually focus on the pink line, which is a five-day average. This is reported every day. And so the raw data is actually very noisy. So you can do one of two things. Either you look at weekly data and just look at the at the data every uh, weekly close, or you smooth it out with the moving average. And that's what I've chosen to do here. So I have the raw data in gray in the background. And then I'm showing a five-day average in pink. That's sort of in the foreground. So look in the background for a moment, and you'll see that the equity-only put-call ratio has spiked dramatically up to above 145. That is by far the highest reading we've had since the uh, the March 2000 market bottom. What's unusual about this is you usually see a spike in the put-call ratio at a market bottom. When the market sells off, that's when you have that extreme spike in the put call ratio. You know, it was the last time we had this sort of big spike in this sort of market phase as the market was going higher? Late 2008, which was just before the 2008 to 2009 sell off. Bring up that chart and bring in the deep history, and you'll see exactly what I mean. We need to wrap the show, folks. That goes by so quickly, but we are there. Let's talk about the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. We start with Biotex again as a teaser. One of the 15 pitches that we heard was on the biotech ETF IBB. When I'm looking at the chart of the IBB, I am struck by this incredibly uh, consistent resistance level, the high in February, in April, in August, and this week, all lining up right around $135, $135 a share for the IBB. Certainly, the technical textbook would tell you this looks like a head and shoulders bottom, sort of an unusual shape, not a completely uh, you know textbook version of that, sort of a a double head here, but you get the idea, a low surrounded by higher lows, a very clearly defined neckline, which is pretty much horizontal here at 135. And we just broke above it earlier this week, only one day later to fall back below there. So in a bull market phase, patterns like this, rotation patterns, uh, bottoming patterns are validated and they break out and biotechs you know, continue to push higher. And this measures pretty much back up to the high that we saw in the third quarter of 2021. But if charts like this fail to break out, failed breakouts are a sign of a bull market in exhaustion. And that's why this uh, chart IBB could be a really important to, one to watch going into next week. Chart number two, Cisco, one of the bigger gainers today in the S&P 500. Cisco uh, up 5% today while the market was down a little bit. If you look and, and you know your uh, chart patterns, you could call this a pennant pattern, which is a big run. You have lower highs higher lows. We've today resolved through that pattern to the upside. So the general way of thinking of this is you take the flagpole, the height of this uh, the, the pattern going in, and you take a similar trajectory. That puts us an objective right around the low 50s, which would take us back to this consolidation in the first quarter of 2022. But first things first, we have to get above the 200-day moving average, which was literally the intraday high today. Can Cisco power above the 200-day, just like the S&P and other indexes, testing that resistance? Let us finish the show on a high note as always. First Solar making a nice breakout to the upside. Earlier this week, I was talking with uh, Larry Tentarelli of Blue Chip Daily, highlighted N phase. We talked about old energy names as well, like the XOP. I want to highlight in the same group as N phase, we have First Solar FSLR. It is the top ranked stock in our large cap scooter rankings, making a new 52 week high again today. And this is after breaking out of this key resistance level here, which became support around 115, nice rotation, now getting above 145, pulling back and resolving to the upside. It is always a good time to own good charts. Folks, that's a wrap for our show today. Special thank you to Julius DeKempner of RRG Research joining us from Amsterdam. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.